Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to 31 Bly Street. I'm Hervé Lemieux, Director of Research here at the Lowy Institute. Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Euro Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the book launch of my friend and colleague, Professor Sean Tunnell. It's a huge honor that we're the first ones up on his extensive program of launch events. And in studying international affairs, we come across lots of rem remarkable stories um, every day. But usually these stories are of hardship, of power and ambition, of intrigue and injustice. So it can be a bit of a miserable business. It's very rare for these stories to bring hope or indeed a happy ending. And Sean's story is both about hardship, but also the very rare exception of a tale of human endeavor overcoming tremendous adversity and fundamentally of optimism prevailing. On the 6th of February, 2021, Sean Tunnell found himself detained by the junta in Myanmar that had just seized power. The man who I believe had never had so much as a parking ticket. Is that right, Sean? Uh, just, uh, unbelievable, but anyway. Uh, had committed the crime of trying to help the Burmese people. He was arrested because he had been an economic advisor to Myanmar's civilian leader, Do Aung San Suu Kyi. And he was charged under Myanmar's Official Secrets Act for carrying, among other things, a document on which he himself, I believe, had scribbled confidential. Um, Sean spent 650 days in prison, during which time we heard very little about him, other than reports of his declining health and multiple bouts uh, with COVID. Supporters and friends, led by his courageous wife and fellow economist Ha Vu, who's here with us today, uh, fought tirelessly for his release behind the scenes and at times in public in an international campaign which enlisted King Charles, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, Foreign Minister Penny Wong, among many others. Sean was finally released on the 17th of November last year, and I remember the picture very well that was flashing across the news of a bearded, uh, emaciated Sean in the arms of Ha, flashing the broadest grin on his face and betraying a chipped tooth. I mean, you were a real pirate, Sean. That was incredible. Um, and as a remarkable testament to his ability to bounce back. He joined us uh, freshly shaven only a few days later at the Sydney Town Hall for the 2022 Lowy Lecture. The nerdy economics professor couldn't miss an opportunity to hear from the Director General of the WTO on deglobalization. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say this, but that night sitting next to him at dinner was the most surreal and, and happiest day of my career, Sean. It really was an incredible moment. We're honored that Sean has chosen since then to make the Lowy Institute his home as a senior fellow in our Southeast Asia program. And uh, he's able to share his expertise, his experience, his incredible good humor with the rest of us every day. And today, almost exactly a year ago to the day since your release, Sean, it is my absolute pleasure and delight uh, to launch your memoir of your time in captivity, an unlikely prisoner, published through Penguin Press. So ladies and gentlemen, can I welcome the remarkable Sean Turnell to the stage. Sean, let's, let's begin. I mean, firstly, what were you doing in Myanmar? I mean, th th that's the first question. I mean, how does uh, an economics professor in Australia end up advising the leader of uh, the first civilian government in Myanmar for decades? Um, how, did, how did that come about? Um, uh, what exactly was the nature of your job? So I think like most things in Myanmar, completely by accident. Um, so years and years ago, 100 years ago, when I was doing my PhD, I lived in a share house that included somebody from, from Burma or from Myanmar. Um, and the stories were fantastic. They were tragic, but they were heroic. And, you know, I got totally captivated with the country. Um, and then gradually over time, um, because, you know, people knew I was an economist back at the Reserve Bank then, um, people asked me to write things about the economy, uh, in particular to critique the military, who were in control even back then. Um, so I started writing things, and my name sort of got passed around some of the democracy people. Um, 
my academic career just fell completely then under me and my work. And I wrote a book on the country's monetary and financial history. And um, somewhat bizarrely, people have heard me express this wonderment before, uh, the BBC Burmese service serialised the book on the radio, um, which, <laughs> yeah, anyway, I, I wasn't this, this thought was it was... Fiery Dragons, uh, This right? was yeah. Fiery Dragons, yeah. which, despite its name, I think was probably used by the radio <laughs> to put people to sleep. But anyway, <laughs> however it was, um, it was broadcast in Burma. Aung San Suu Kyi got to listen to it. Um, and from that, we sort of began to be in contact. She was then released from house arrest in 2010, which, on what we hoped was going to be the last time, um, and... Yeah, I met her in person, we established a real rapport, um, and then finally, 2015, a series of economic reforms and political reforms along the way, elections held, NLD, National League for Democracy and Dorsu come into government, and on the day after the election, uh, she said to me, Sean, you know, you've been helping us all these years, you've been writing all this stuff, why don't you come over and give us a hand at actually doing the things? So um, I got permission from Macquarie Uni, uh, support from Department of Foreign Affairs here in Australia, permission from my wife, and uh, went over to Myanmar and, um, yeah, started working from there. So. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about the, uh, in some sense, the culture shock, not only a functioning uh, in a very different country to Australia, but actually the culture shock, more importantly, of transitioning from academia to policy practice um, and also of, of making the kind of uh, everyday uh, trade-offs, I, I think, that are a necessary part of, of any job in power uh, between idealism and pragmatism. So I'm sure this will shock everyone in the, in the world, in, in the room, sorry. Um, Real-world policy-making is really different <laughs> from what you write in an academic paper. Um, so, so we had a blueprint of what to do. Um, which was sort of the standardised thing, but very much adapted to Myanmar's circumstances and history and all of that. But, yeah, day to day, uh, you're constantly running into things. Um, Myanmar's bureaucracy had been built up over 70 years, just about, of military rule. It was sclerotic. It was top-down. It was like a... It was designed for a command economy. So every day, we struggle just to get anything through. And on a good day, you got something really small through. Um, on a bad day, you'd actually go backwards. But, um, yeah, but a real struggle. And as Herve said, lots and lots of compromises along the way. You know, you might have a, a policy you think, now, this would really work. But, yeah, just having to jettison bits here and there, uh, maybe because of politics, sometimes just circumstances. Mm. And those were, I mean, incredible years from 2015 onwards. Um, but things started going a little bit awry. I mean, the pressure um, and, and the, um, the relationship breakdown between Aung San Suu Kyi and the military, that was something that was, you know, it had never really fully reconciled to begin with, but there was a sort of de facto working arrangement, which I think started to un, un, become undone at the seams uh, in the lead up to the uh, second election, the one in 2020. And at the same time, you were dealing with uh, 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 an international community um, that had really started turning against uh, Dong Sung Suu Kyi. So tell us a little bit about what that was like. Uh, I mean, I know you were working on economics. You weren't across all the briefs, but still you had a first-hand account um, of, of what it was like to be in that government. What was the mood like at the time? So the mood at the beginning was um, incredibly enthusiastic. Um, in fact, I know there's many people in this room who were there. there. There was just a feeling in Myanmar that you could do anything. We were starting something new. We really were going to get the last and best of the tigers. Um, yeah, things started to go wrong. Um, I mean, th there was the compromises that we mentioned earlier, just the struggle to get things through. Um, but then halfway through, I'm sure people will remember the story, the terrible story, right, where Myanmar's military just started massacring people in Rakhine State, the, the Rohingya. Um, now, the interesting thing about that was that we knew that they would try something because, as Herve said, the, the relationship between the civilian government and the military was always an uneasy one and a sort of unacknowledged one. It wasn't like there was any formal deal or anything like that. Communication between the two was near non-existent. Yeah. Um, and even at the best of times, communication was often through the media, through proxies, things like that. So, yeah, a very uneasy relationship. 
then we get the atrocities, the near genocide against the Rohingya. Um, and we had expected the military to try and do something to devalue the National League for Democracy, to bring Dor Su down. Um, so then we had to try and deal with that. Um, at this point, too, I think everyone, you know, um, the biggest supporters of the government would acknowledge a lot of mistakes were made, particularly in communication, because behind the scenes there was a huge amount going on to try on on the civilian government side to try and lessen the, the atrocities going on and trying to pull the military back. Um, but they had to be very, very careful because throughout the whole time I was there, there was always a feeling that the military were a hair trigger away of coming in. Um, in fact, I remember it quite distinctly because I was living in Napidor, the this bizarre capital city in the middle of the country through most of that, and you wouldn't have a day go by almost without sort of a rumour of a coup. And, and you know, the, it might be just a, a few trucks, army trucks or something parked at a, at a shopping centre or something and rumours would develop from that. So, yeah, so there was always this incredible unease, um, this feeling that the military could come in at any time. Um, so people like Su Chi had to sort of juggle all of this. Um, and, and again, communication's terrible. How to send the signal to the military using proxies, sometimes publicly, sometimes in other ways, um, trying to lessen that. We've got the international community, quite rightly, completely outraged about what's going on for the Rohingya, and then trying to deal with that all at once, you know, and trying not to trigger the military. Um, so it was really difficult. Um, lots of things being done, yeah, in the background, including by myself. And as Hervé mentioned, the um, one particular document that the regime used against me in the trial was uh, set out a program through which we could use our inside information of the financial system to target some of the military figures who were causing the atrocities in Rakhine. Um, and, yeah, that, when, when I saw that, uh, my interrogators presented that to me, I was really worried because I thought, wow, this is, this is the smoking gun. Um, thankfully, I don't think they ever read it, <laughs> which is... <laughs> but, it, but it did have confidential on it, and, and the confidential stamp was put on by me. Um, but, again, you might have heard me say this. Uh, it still led the interrogator to tell me, well, it doesn't matter that you wrote it. You shouldn't have had it, and above all, you shouldn't have read it. So... <laughs> shouldn't have declared it confidential, I think it's... Yeah, yeah. indeed. Um, so, take... I mean, I, I remember you were... In fact, in Sydney over the Christmas break, I believe, but just before flying back to Yangon, that's right. We were we were actually meant to meet up, and then you you left. I remember yeah. we exchanged an, an email, but yeah. so you went back into uh, what was a very um, tense and dynamic situation. Um, but the the sort of orthodoxy at the time was that the military wouldn't consider a coup because. In many ways, the whole game was stacked in their favor to begin with. I mean, the 2008 constitution created a diarchic system in which the military retained its power over the ministries of defense, uh, home affairs, uh, policing, uh, what was it, border areas. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and why would they squander a system that they had so carefully set up um, through years of you know, constitutional conventions in ways you know, or by people that really favored their interests? Um, and yet they did so. Uh, they did so. And, and was there any sign in the lead up in the immediate days before the coup that, that things were going to go very awry? Um, what, what, sort of, what was the first inkling that something was going to happen? So there, there were signs, but um, as I mentioned earlier, there were always signs. And so trying to filter out whether this was anything different than the past was a, was a, you know, a problematic thing. Um, and also around that time, one of the weirdest things is that Myanmar's election cycle almost exactly tracked America's. So uh, election in November, um, in America, what is January 20, isn't it, where the That's president right. comes in? But yeah. in Myanmar, it was about March. But there was this election in November, this long gap in between, and again, sort of tracking Donald Trump a little bit, um, the military were using the same sort of arguments, that the, the election was rigged, it was, you know, even though in this case it wasn't even close, right? So the, it was about 80% of the vote went to uh, Su Chi's party. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the military were complaining a lot. So, so the, there was this drumbeat of uh, vitriol from the military. Um, but exactly as you've described, Hervé, it didn't make sense that they would have a coup uh, because they, they were in the box seat in many ways. Um, al although I'll come to as to why they might have might not have been in a moment, but um, but they thought they'd rigged the system really well. Um, yeah, complete control of home affairs, complete control of the military, including over the budget, 
as the, the civilian government couldn't even question the budget, wasn't allowed to be discussed in Parliament, for instance. So, so they, they were sitting pretty. They had lots of crony enterprises all around them that were well-placed and all that. So it didn't seem to make sense. The only thing is, I, th I think a couple of things came in. Um, number one was that the senior general, who's the leader of the country now, this guy called Min Ong Lai, um, his term of office was coming to an end because of age. He would have had to retire. He was then very exposed to action at the International Criminal Court and other places. Um, and he was worried that Su Chi and the civilian government could hand him over. So there was that. The other thing was, in retrospect, and after being interrogated and so on, it was clear that the economic reforms were beginning to work. And so that cosy deal that had been stitched up where the military sort of kept their power very separately was coming under pressure. Uh, and some of those crony enterprises were coming under pressure as we were opening up the economy, bringing in foreign investment and so on. So uh, I think that's partly as well, that, that they began to feel that things were moving against them. So uh, having said all of that, it still makes no sense. It's absolutely irrational. And if we look at the situation now, the biggest losers, well, apart from the Myanmar people, they're, they're the biggest losers, of course, um, but significant people around the military regime, crony enterprise and all that, have lost hundreds of millions of dollars. So it, it's, it's a failed enterprise, but mm. yet they did it. They did it. Um, tell us a little bit now about the circumstances of your arrest. So I, I believe you were in a, a hotel room, the Chatrium, is that right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, Ha, I'm sure, would have already been, you know, on tenterhooks and somewhat nervous. Um, there was news that a coup had happened, yep. uh, but then there was a strange kind of few hours in between the coup happening and you still being a free man. Yep. So were there any attempts made to try to get you out of the country? I know there were others in your situation who were successfully yep. very rapidly repatriated. Uh, that didn't happen for you. So, so what, what, situ what was your situation yep. like? What were you being told? And how did they ultimately uh, come to arrest you? Yeah. So the um, the, the coup itself was a shock uh, to me. Um, I'd been in contact with Su Chi's office only the day before just to see what was happening. Um, th sorry, this is before the coup. And uh, I'd been advised, because I was due to go to leave my hotel, go up to Napidor, and we were going to... Actually, we are going to launch the new economic plan. The, that was the story. Um, but she advised me, Sean, look... Postponed a bit, just a few days. We think there are rogue elements of the military on the roads, and, and if they see you, they'll probably hassle you and all that. So let, let's put it off till Wednesday, I think it was, or something. Um, then the coup happened. Um, and uh, But, yeah, so a, a real surprise. Um, I, I got notification through an email from someone uh, purportedly on the staff of the hotel just saying that, look, you need to get out. Um, uh, military intelligence have taken over the hotel. Um, but leading up to that point, uh, I tried to get out. Uh, I was a little bit complacent at first, to be honest. I, I thought, oh, OK, you know, though I'm a foreigner. Or, or, and above all, too, I thought the coup might just disappear mm. uh, because it was a near-run thing, I think, in those early hours. So for a couple of reasons, I, I wasn't too worried to begin with. I was more worried about Burmese colleagues and hoping that they would get to the border or get, get to safety. Um, then it became apparent that I, I needed to worry. But the big thing, of course, which we all remember, this is the middle of COVID. So there are no flights in and out. In fact, I'd gone into the country in January on a special... Remember those evacuation flights that were moving workers and people all around? So I, I'd had to get a special seat on a plane. There was nothing going out. Well, there were a few flights going out, but, of course, now they're totally full. So literally for me to get a seat would have been bumping somebody off. Um, one of the things that I've only just remembered, you know, in the last few days as I've been telling the story, I suddenly remembered I did get a seat. Finally, I got a seat that I will probably remember on to London. And I was going to go to London, I remember. And, and I had visions of, oh, wouldn't it be terrible to be going to London for a few months? <laughs> um, but anyway, it didn't happen. The, the, uh, my arrest that, that then took place. Yeah, so I was trying to get out, but, but just couldn't. It was a bit too late then. Mm, it's too late. And what did you think would happen? I mean, what, once you were arrested, uh, what was your sense in terms of, you know, what did you tell yourself in terms of, oh, I'll be, will, will you be out of here in a short period of time? Were you still hopeful that this situation could be resolved? It was all a misunderstanding. Yeah. What were you thinking? Yeah, so 
my complacency continued even after being arrested and so on. And being arrested was horrible. I don't want to underplay that. That was really frightening and I was scared and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, I, but I thought it would end. Um, again, for that same complacency about rational actors and what they might do, and in, in the sense that I thought, well, OK, the, there's going to be huge international fuss about this. The world will be against them. Why would they keep me? It didn't make any sense. It's just going to be another area through which the rest of the world can attack them and agitate and all that. Um, and also the long history of Myanmar, which usually what they do is they arrest foreigners and then deport them, more or less straight away. Um, yeah, so I was still quite well into it, thinking, OK, look, they're just going to really frighten me and then just send me out. So I maintained that for, for quite a time. But they were really keen to hear from you about, in particular, one country, which was you know Britain and uh, British spies. And uh, I mean, w why this obsession with Britain? It's really interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I was constantly being accused of working for MI6. Um, but also George Soros simultaneously. So uh, it, it might be news to George that you know, he's connected to James Bond. But um, yeah, no, they're obsessed about this. And, and I think it's a colonial hangover. Basically, so probably everyone knows here that you know Myanmar, when it was known as Burma, part of the British Empire and all that, and always that thing of perfidious Albion in the background, stirring things up, pushing the strings or pulling the strings rather, um, and even when you know America's the dominant actor and all that, but behind them, same forces. <laughs> so I think it was just that it was this obsession that that if there was trouble, if there were foreigners interfering, that that's ultimately where it was. And, and to be honest, I think being Australian or being British... I don't know, close enough. The next, close enough. You were the next best thing to actual <laughs> Brits right. they could get. And it actually reminds me a little bit of uh, the Russians, similarly, in their propaganda. But I think also by conviction are convinced that the Brits are behind everything, right? right? Whether right. that's the Middle East crisis or something yep. else. Uh, they're, they're the last, I mean, the Burmese and the Russians are the last big believers in, uh, in Great Britain. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, but um, look, I mean, coming back to more serious circumstances, I mean, you, you were, the first two months were not, you know, you were, you were held in solitary confinement in, in, yep. in something called the box, is that right? So can you yeah, describe so I, that? I, I called it the box. Yeah. Nobody else called it yeah. the box. <laughs> But it was sort of, I, I've described it in many places as like a, a shipping container. You know, it's about as big as this stage, actually, about this sort of size. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a horrible. Like, it was a room inside a room in the, uh, the headquarters of CID. Um, and had not, like, concrete floor and, and just wood panelling sort of walls, fake wood walls. And then a chair, just a metal chair, just bolted into the centre of the floor, um, in which there were chains on the arms and on the feet, and with ankle and, and wrist cuffs and manacles on them. So it was a horrific image. Um, and it had no windows or anything like that, except a tiny slit window where the police outside could look into the, to the box. Um, and then a couple of lights, oh, about three powerful lights were on, and a, and a fan, a single fan near the top. So, um, yeah, but I was, I was held in there for two months and uh, allowed nothing in. Um, so, yeah, it was probably the worst... Well, not probably. It, it was the worst time, I think, physically. Mm. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, but, you know, I, I coped through it. And, and you know, in, in some of the media, people have often asked me, like, how did I cope in that situation? Um, and it's interesting to me that the, the first thing you do... I think we'd all do it because it's probably hardwired. It's just pace. You move up and down like you need to be to be moving, um, and so pacing from one end to the other and counting was a real soothing thing because it sort of it stopped you thinking for a start by just simply counting, but it sort of gave you control over the space over the domain. So um, yeah, it was sort of a way of getting control a, a little bit as well. But yeah, but but a pretty horrible place because the, the lights were never off except when the blackouts were on during the day. Um, which uh, was an early sign that the military were already mishandling the economy. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was a... Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I give it one star or less <laughs> <laughs> accommodation. Um, do you... I mean, I mean we're, we're laughing with it now, and I suppose humour is one of the big, you know, ways in which you can preserve your sanity. Um, but, but, you know, it, how do you not lose your sense of not only time, but also self in that situation. I mean, did you feel as if you were, you know, how close to a sort of proper mental breakdown do you yeah. feel that you, you got? 
a few times. I, I lost it a few times yeah. and just stood at the door shaking the shell at uh, the, the cell doors um, and shouting obscenities that I didn't even know that I had access yeah. to, <laughs> um, particularly about men online, his parentage and proclivities and, <laughs> and so on. Um, but um, in fact, so much so, I remember on one evening, oh, this, this is a little bit later up in Napidor, that some of my friends amongst the, the Myanmar economic reformers came to see me the next day because I'd, I'd be doing this at night. And they said, John, are you OK? And, and I said, oh, look, yeah, it's OK. It's just an Australian way of... Of getting it out, because um, they they were much more stoic. I never saw a single. None of them ever lost it once. They were very very calm. Uh, they've very, had very experience brave. as well. I think a lot of the yeah. political prisoners and the former the, the NLD government yeah. had, had spent you know years in prison and absolutely and incredibly yeah. stoic. And so by this point, you'd already you'd been transferred to a sort of more general wing. This was yeah. this is insane prison still in Yangon. Or, yeah. yeah. So yeah. after the box for two yeah. months, I was then moved into in the wonderfully named in insane prison, yeah. um, which is a nineteenth century British yeah. construction, right? A, yeah. a panopticon yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's a mar- like in in the book. First book plug <laughs> in the book. There's a picture of um, of insane, and it's like a big wagon wheel, um, and um, yeah, divided up into little sort of pizza slices with the different wards of the prison. But and in the middle, so it all comes from Jeremy Bentham, the famous uh, philosopher and social reformer, the uh, idea of the panopticon of, of prison reform, actually, 19th century England. But um, from the centre, there's a giant tower which is meant to economise on staffing because then the warders can just look from the tower and see all parts of the prison. But, um, yeah, but it, but it was well built, really run down, but still in some ways in a more functioning condition than later prisons I was in that had been built, you know, a century later. Um, but, yeah, extraordinary place. And, and um, I always remember, though, marching towards, after being taken through these terrible big doors of the of the prison, which was like entering Mordor in Lord of the Rings. Um, but marching along there with my clanking guards and so on all the way and seeing the tower ahead of me because we had to sort of head, toward, head towards the centre. And just to continue the Lord of the Rings <laughs> analogy, it was like Sauron. It was like the, the great eye. Um, but, yeah, horrible place. Mm. <laughs> The, I mean, at what point, I think it was sometime while you were in prison, you decided you'd write a book. Is, mm-hmm. is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. so, so at what point and why did you Very decide? Very early to on. Um, it, it was part of the coping mechanism as well because it gave me something to think about. Um, so, in fact, about one third of the book, but particularly part two, I think it is, um, totally from memory. In fact, I didn't even have to, it was almost like muscle memory, actually, in writing it when I got back. So, um, so. That was give, to give me something to think about, um, and it required like a lot of discipline and, and again a way of not thinking about anything else. Like so, when I literally constructed sentences, and in my head I would even change a word or a comma on a given day and think, oh no, that doesn't work. And yeah, so uh, so it was it was good from that point. Um, I also wanted to send that signal to my Myanmar colleagues um, because I knew one of the real dilemmas is that. Well, as, as you alluded to, I think at the beginning, of eight, um, Myanmar just goes down the list of international interests, and so many people don't care, and you know all that. So I, I knew that I would be in a position if I ever got out to, um, yeah, to tell a story, and I wanted to tell my Myanmar colleagues that, and to say that that their struggle wouldn't be uh, forgotten. I also had a very practical thing actually in telling them that, um, because I wanted to get their feel, their permission, about telling their story and using their names and things like that. Um, and interestingly enough, to a person amongst the major figures in the book, they all wanted to be in the book. In fact, they were most worried that that I might put a pseudonym for them. So it was the opposite of, of what I might have thought. So that's why in the book I, I do have pseudonyms for some people who I've not been able to contact at the time or whatever and I need to protect and things like that. Um, but the leading figures were all you know, uh, OK with what I was going to do. I mean, you talk about your your friends in in prison. Um, I mean, this is a hard question, but but you know, do do you know how they're doing? Um, where are they now? I believe some of them have been released as part of amnesty deals. Others might still be in prison. Others were not that fortunate at all because you describe some really heavy-handed interrogation yeah. tactics, yeah. and of course, <clears throat> the Burmese themselves were with you know were the most. Exposed to that heavy-handedness, uh, 
to the extent that you're comfortable, could you sort of describe what some of your friends went through and, and how they're doing? Yeah. So, I mean, firstly, just what they went through was much worse than, than mine. So I, I was sort of, you know, roughed up a, a few times and things like that. Um, but they they got the full measure. Um, in fact, one one guy um, who, who was actually an American citizen as well as um, Myanmar, he, he had the full thing. He, he had the electro put on him and electrocuted. Um, he had scars on his face from beatings and all that. And and yet, you know, he's an American citizen and, and uh, American consular people were, were getting in touch with him and all that. So, but, but for the ones who didn't even have that, that went even further, you know. So, um, yeah, so the, their, their treatment was awful. Um, and I felt for them, you know, to, you know, to say felt for them, it doesn't, doesn't describe it enough, but, um, you know, because I, I, I had a whole government behind me. I had... Har and Fuong behind me. I had I had all this support. I had you know everyone here. I knew what the ruckus that will be causing in Australia. For my Burmese colleagues, they don't even have that. Right? They're, they're just lost in a terrible system um, and treated in the way you described. Um, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, the, their treatment was terrible. Since I got out, um, a few have been released. In fact, some were released before I was released as well, depending on, on what they were being charged with and all that. So some have been released, um, some still haven't, and some have disappeared completely. And I sort of worry most about the latter category. I worry about the ones who are still in captivity. I worry about the ones who have been released but still in the country. Um, yeah, so, yeah, basically I just worry, you know, more or less constantly. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there was one particular friend that you mentioned um, who was, happened to be Muslim as well. Uh, yes, yes. And did, was, he, was he killed? I mean, sorry. He was, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So the yeah. worst case of all, yeah. uh, Kim Mong Shui, his name yeah. was, um, but he had the Islamic name of Jacob, so I, I knew him completely as Jacob. Yeah. Um, and he was fantastic. He looked after me. He, was, uh, he cooked food for me. He... he clean things for me. In fact, he did so much, he couldn't do enough. It was, um, and the, very often I'd say, Jacob, no, 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 you don't have to do this. We're in this together. I can I can do all this. And But he was, yeah, would just do so much. Um, and also, he, but he was a very strong character um, and uh, so strong, actually, that the prison guards were frightened of him. Um, and, and he had the appearance. He had the beard and everything. And, and yeah, they were generally frightened of him. Um, so, they were out to get him, basically. And so uh, he was OK uh, up to the point that, that I'd left insane uh, in Yangon, transferred up to Napidor. Um, and then I was a year up in Napidor, finally eventually came back to Yangon, back to insane prison. And one of the things, first things I wanted to find out when I got back was where was everyone? And, and above all, where was Jacob? Was he around? Um, and I'll never forget the horrible day that I said to one of the interpreters, um, I said, well, well, where's Jacob? And... And the guy said to me, oh, Sean, he, he's gone. Uh, and, and I thought he meant, oh, he's been released. This, this is great. And he said, no, 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 Sean, you misunderstand. He's dead. And I said, how? And, yeah, it turns out that um, a fake fight was sort of staged. He'd gone in there just outside his cell, in his cell. The details were a little bit unclear. but um, And he'd intervened. And, and that's very him because he was always, like, safeguarded me, but he tried to be safeguard everyone, basically. Um, he, he somehow, yeah, got pulled into the fight. We think to break it up. But the two assailants then turned on him, as did then the prison guards, who kicked him and beat him to death, basically. He lingered on for a day and then died the, the next day. So, yeah, it was a really horrifying... I mean, horrifying at so many levels, but um, it, it came at a bad moment for me because this was after the trial, after the conviction... That was the last moment that I thought I would be released because mm. I thought I'd be convicted and then just deported. But I then spent a few more months in, in Insane and one of the first things I found in going back to Insane was the news about that. So, yeah, terrible uh, circumstance. I, I particularly pay honour to him in the book. and There's a photograph of him in the book and so on. Um, and, again, I've been in touch with his family and things like that. But, yeah, no, awful story, but representative of so many others in there, more or less. Mm. There were moments that gave you a bit more hope, um, if not on your case, and in terms of the, the kind of, you know, drip feed of um, news stories that um, somehow made its way, in, you know, through the prison system yeah. uh, into your ears or, you know, for, you know, something that you could read and that sort of stuff. And I believe actually the Lowy interpreter 
uh, our blog was uh, one of the things that managed to make its way into the to the uh, to prison, so that you could um, keep yourself busy and occupied and and aware of what was going on in the world around you. And I think in the book you also describe how um, uh, you came to hear about AUKUS, Indeed. which was a real sort of fist pumping moment. I mean, uh, for you. So what was your reaction? Yeah. And and I remember then also at the Lowy lecture last year, you had read about AUKUS, but of course, like so many of us, when we yeah. first heard about the concept yeah. or the acronym, yeah. we had no bloody idea how to pronounce it. <laughs> and you didn't. And you did, you actually had to ask me, well, yeah. what is it? How do yeah, you yeah. pronounce it? I've read this term. But anyway, right. Tell me what what you felt about. Yeah. I mean, what what was it about yeah. AUKUS that that made yeah. you feel so pumped? Yeah. So I should say, too, that the, the channel for all this was, again, ha. Huh? Um, so I had all this material photocopied and, and sent through through to me by the embassy and, and so on. Um, and, uh, yeah, one of them was the Lowy interpreter, where I read about this this thing. Um, but, no, that's right. I'd had a heads up before then because uh, a, um, a guard came to me and said, uh, it was relatively nice one, he just something to say. He said, oh, Sean, Australia's bought nuclear submarines. And I thought, oh, OK. <laughs> and he said, you're going to start nuking people. <laughs> and I thought, oh, all right. And, of course, I think around that time there were so many other things going on. I, I misremember now the order of events, but, you know, the world was going to hell in the way that it has been. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going on out there? Um, but, but I was very pumped at the idea. I thought, wow, yes, this is great. <laughs> um, so it, it gave me a real lift for a, for a day or two. Um, and I could think about submarines. And I asked Hart to send me details about the submarines. Um, and, uh, yeah, but above all, I didn't know how to say it. I thought, wow, how do you pronounce this? Well, what are people calling this? And then, yeah, when I saw Hervé a few days after getting back, Hervé, how do you pronounce this? <laughs> That's, uh, it was quite a, a funny moment there, I'm trying to catch up on, you know, two years' worth of events, global events um, and, and the like. Um, Look, I mean, we're going to fast forward a little bit, but you're, you're you know, you, you've gone through this uh, um, kind of sham trial. Um, in fact, you were able to interact with Aung San Suu Kyi then as well. Yeah. So, I mean, what was what was it like to to catch up with Dos Su because you were both in your respective corners of the yeah. um, draconian, you know, yeah. system. Yeah. Uh, she's been kept in isolation for yeah. a long time now, but but in these rare moments, you could actually in court, you could yeah. you, you did actually interact with her. So, yeah. what, what what was her state of mind? What did you talk about? So I had lots of really substantive conversations with her, and uh, the the, the Dorsu that we'd known all along was there. If you know what I mean, incredibly strong. Um, but yeah, we had so many wonderful conversations and things, but I, but I should preface that by saying the initial encounter was anything but impressive on my part, because I couldn't think of what to say. I hadn't seen her for a long time. Then she's a prisoner, I'm a prisoner. I'd, I'd last seen her as leader of the country. She gets ushered into a room. I sort of approach her, and all I could think of was saying, I think the force is still with us. <laughs> Which, it, sounds, it sounds so pathetic now, even to recount it. Um, in, in my defence, which I've got in the book, um, we were both sort of Star Wars fans, so it sort of came naturally. There was a context, but still. Um, did she get it? She did, okay. yes, and she agreed and said, yes, it is short. Um, but, um, yeah, we had many conversations, um, mostly not about the trial, because the trial was just such nonsense. There wasn't really anything to say. Um, but uh, she was incredibly supportive of the rest of us and, and someone like me. As you mentioned, Herve, which is absolutely true, I never even got a parking ticket. Um, and um, uh, so she wanted to con to reassure someone like myself, but the others as well, was that even though there were all these accoutrements of a penal justice system, blah, 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 that this was, this was all a sham and that we had to make sure that we, we knew that and deeply understood it and not to get caught up. Um, because, you know, if you're in an environment with prosecutors and police and judges and all the rest of it, it's all too easy to slip into the feeling that you, gee, maybe I did do something wrong. Um, but... Yeah, so she was very, very anxious to say, no, look, this is politics, it's a sham. Um, yeah, which is, again, quite helpful for someone like me. Do you think that she regrets any of the decisions that she took in the lead-up to the coup? I mean, or, 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 you know, was it a foregone, inevitable conclusion that there would be a coup or that Minam Line is largely irrational and... Um, <clears throat> did you get the sense that she felt that things could have been done differently? I don't think so. Um, it's a good question, right? Um, 
in some ways, the conversations between us, there were some topics we couldn't really get close to because mm. we were always in a room. There was one room in this sort of sham, shambolic sort of courthouse that there weren't cameras, but we always suspected that there were bugs of something. So, so we had to be quite careful in what, what we spoke about. We, we did touch upon it a little. Um, funnily enough, and, and it'd be interesting because I, I don't know when the history of this can ever be written because of all the players are in prison or, you know, uh, on the other side. Because um, there, there were some very fraught negotiations that broke down and all that. There, there were different... In, in my conversations with other people as well, some of the ministers in the prison, I used to hear different stories about w what was happening in those last few days and all that. Um, so uh, I'm sure there are, there are um, aspects to that, that that could have gone differently, things like that. But I, I never heard her give an opinion on those, um, even though obviously she knew probably more than anyone else. But, mm. yeah, so I think the history on that, yeah, still awaits, I think. It awaits, and it's potentially your next book project because the other two-thirds, you said you, one-third of this book you thought yeah. of while you were in prison, and the other, you know, the two-thirds of the rest of the material is making its way into a policy memoir uh, <clears throat> which may or may not be your next project at the Lowy Institute, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to that one. But you do, you know, are, are, you are in that unique position of, of having had a, a ringside seat in, in, in those key years between 2015 and 2020. But, but let's return. So what, what point did you feel that things were potentially changing for you, that, you know, your fortune was, was shifting and, and that you, there might be a release uh, coming? And did you allow yourself to hope or, or was that actually something that um, in many ways was psychologically hard to even, yeah. you know, if you go there and then you're disappointed, you're, you know, it's, it's a terrible yeah. thing. So at what point did you feel or did you let yourself believe that things yeah. could actually change for you? So you, you, I, I let myself believe all the time. Um, what, what, one of the insights that I had from being in the prison was how wishful thinking is so powerful. Even though you, you try not to have it, you, you, it just overcomes you. Um, and I, again, I think I've got this in the book, where there was a rumour went round the, the prison very early on that the US 7th Fleet were off Yangon, uh, two aircraft carriers, and the US Marines would be there in the end of the week. Now, it was so absurd, right? <laughs> this is ridiculous. But I can remember thinking, oh, OK, <laughs> maybe. Um, so, you've got, like, so, yeah, all sorts of weird stuff you would, you would just believe, even though you told yourself it wouldn't happen. But having said that, so th there were episodes like that, um, but actually I, I was trending downwards in terms of feeling of being released because, uh, and particularly at the end. So, so I actually never felt the ground shifting towards me um, because the, the day before I was released, in fact, one year ago tomorrow, um, Har and I had a, what turned out to be our last phone call in the prison and we reconciled to each other that I was going to be there for a few more months, that I would still be there at Christmas time, another Christmas would go by, and I was released the very next day. So it was a total shock. Um, but, yeah, and, but on that phone call on, on the uh, 16th uh, of November, um, yeah, we, we, I, I was probably the lowest ebb at that point because I thought, OK, I've been convicted now, I've been back and insane for a couple of months. There's no dates. Because there's a tradition in Myanmar of releasing people on religious holidays. Mm. Um, and I thought the next one of them is not until March. Um, and, yeah, I'd sort of given up hope. Little did I know... There was a very obscure religious holiday on the 17th, <laughs> which turned out to be the, the day. It's a good thing there's so many of yeah. them, right? Uh, uh, indeed. So, so yeah. you were holding out for the water festival, was that? Or, That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah Thing yeah, yeah, right. I was yeah. holding out yeah. to that. Yeah. yeah. And then you were, it was you and, I mean, in terms of the internationals that were released, it was Vicky Bowman, yep. um, former British ambassador to the yep. UK, who had then joined an NGO and was actually... Uh, for, you know, also my former landlady in London, as it happens. But I, I remember seeing <laughs> pic pictures of you on a shuttle bus at the airport, or yep. did I dream that? I mean, there was, yeah, yeah, no. No. Um, so that must have been a bit of a surreal moment. Uh, tell us what it was yeah. like to, to be on your way to the airport, to get in that plane, yeah. uh, you know. I mean, you... yeah, totally surreal. Um, but matched always by an anxiety that was still going to go wrong um, because Myanmar has a history sometimes, well, particularly under this regime, of them releasing people and then charging them anew. And so it wasn't until I got on the plane. And in fact, actually, it wasn't until the plane landed in Bangkok that I really felt safe. But, um, but, but having said that, I mean, yeah, the, the, the trip in the minibus with 
with Vicky and others was yeah a wonderful moment and, and we were all talking about what we do when we got home and you know all, all that sort of stuff um, and uh, and then arrived at the airport and you know all the diplomats are there and, and it was just surreal and and I'm as you identify I've got this straggly beard I've got this dirty old shirt that because I've been exercising in the morning when they told me to be released and I didn't have I couldn't shower or anything. I'm smelly and look terrible. Um, and uh, and I'm, we're sort of hobnobbing with diplomats and champagnes coming out. <laughs> it's just very odd. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but yeah, all surreal, but, but very nice. Incredible, incredible. Um, look, I mean, I think now is probably an opportune time to um, open it up to uh, audience questions. I'm sure there are plenty of them. We've got about 15. Uh, minutes left. I have plenty more questions, Sean, I could ask you, but uh, now seems a good good time to, to ask uh, anyone to raise their hands um, and uh, identify themselves and uh, and ask Sean a question. Any interest? Uh, the lady there in the middle. Yeah. Thank you. Johanna Pittman, uh, CEO of Advanced Global Australians. So um, really just very interested in your perspective on the economic um, future for Myanmar and what you're seeing now at this juncture, um, what hopes you hold for it? So I think un under the current regime, I have almost no hope um, because um, what, what they've set out to do is to dismantle all the reforms, um, which, which in their own mind has a certain logic to it because, again, those reforms were moving in directions that was, you know, essentially against their rule because, I mean, the whole economic problem of Myanmar, the original sin, was that there was this military just sort of sucking up all the resources. So we, we were trying to open things up, reduce their influence on the economy and all of that. So, you know, it's with great sort of alacrity that they've moved to dismantle all of that. Um, but, of course, they've turned the whole country into a disaster. I mean, it's, it's just war from one end of the country to the other. GDP fell 25% in that first year. It's still I mean, it's way below where it was in 2019. Um, you know, 40% of the population are now in poverty. In every measure you can think of, inflation, unemployment, what, uh, I mean, everything. It, it's just all this, this absolute catastrophe. Um, and, of course, it's going to require a great amount of effort and trust and all that to turn it around because, you know, unless the military is taken completely out now, it, it's it's hard to imagine any sort of compromise, right? Because it, if, if they're sitting there, um, you know, where do the reforms go? So, yeah, I'm deeply pessimistic at that level. Although having said that, and Herve and I were talking about this earlier, I mean, the news lately out of Myanmar over the last week, last few days, has been hopeful. Um, the, the regime which has been on the back foot, you know, in, in so many areas, now seem to be on the back foot on the battlefield. And so um, it's just interesting. You're getting lots of stories. I don't want to get ahead of myself because we've spent 30 years looking for this sort of thing. But it is possible now to see mass defections of troops, instability at the top, and a whole range of other things that suggest that maybe this regime is not going to be around for too much longer. So... That's that, that's the optimism at the moment. Mm. <coughs> oh, just just hold on for the mic as we're recording this as well. Thanks. Hi, my name's uh, Chris Hughes. I've uh, also spent a bit of time uh, in Myanmar and uh, known Sean for a little while. But on, on a similar theme, actually, uh, looking forward, um, it's painful sometimes to look back, even though you do it with such great humour. Um, I mean, it's a thorny question, I think, right now about whether and if if we do, how we engage with Myanmar at a government level, but also even at a civil society and and, and economic level. But you know, we've Australia's put out its um, uh, long-term strategy for Southeast Asian engagement, and and Myanmar is just excluded completely from that as as part of the methodology of that of that sort of study. Um, I think that's a bit a bit sort of strange, but from a um, uh, I guess from from your perspective, I mean, what counsel would you give now about uh, any level of engagement with Myanmar at a more th thinking more at an economic level uh, at the present, you know, in the, in the near term, but also taking a longer term view? What, what sort of advice would you give on that? Yeah. So I think the most productive thing Australia can do on that front is to engage in non-government actors. Um, so so there is still, you know. Um, uh, 
Myanmar civil society, um, some of the private business and all of that. They're, they're, I mean, the core of that is still there, you know, and, and is, is the future. So I think the, the, um, the institutional frame that's under the control of, of the regime at the moment is sort of irredeemable, in, in my view. And, and, and I think any sort of support for that, even, um, even sort of indirectly through UN agencies and so on, I, th I think is probably misguided. Um, but, but support for other actors who not only are important to support at the moment, but I think important for the future, um, there, there's still something be, to be done there. You know, the, the, these are the actors who will reconstruct the economy. Um, the the uh, national unity government from outside, um, most of whom I didn't know before, you know, being released, um, have been enormously impressive, particularly on the economic side. Um, the the degree to which factionalism and things like that has been really minimised, it seems to me. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I, th I think there's things that can, can be done, but essentially it's about supporting, I guess, non-government, non-regime non actors, yeah. Mm. There's a question uh, at the front there. Hello, Professor Turnell. Thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, let me reintroduce myself. I'm um, the mother of Kim Edwards who's the program leader and senior economist for the World Bank uh, and his uh, territories, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. Yeah. So he goes there quite regularly. My question is, uh, first of all, do you have a gag order? Can you say anything you want to say outside of Myanmar? And secondly, most important, is, is he safe? Cool. Um, well, <laughs> um, I mean, the, the good thing about working for the World Bank is that there are parameters through which of, of what you can say, uh, and you'll have, you know, di quasi diplomatic protection and all that. And I'm sure he'd be very careful. And, and, and in fact, I, I broadly know of him, and, and he's very careful, very professional, and all that. So I'm sure he'd be safe. Um, the, um, uh, for me, um, there, there's nothing to, to stop me saying anything, uh, living here in Australia. And, and in fact, I have said lots of things. <laughs> you, you've been reprimanded, though, by uh, well, Ipidor, haven't they? They indeed. tried to re-arrest you, didn't they? Indeed. From... So so the regime gets very upset. <laughs> so, and in fact, Min Ong Lai personally, I think, is most affronted um, that I had the temerity to suggest, you know, that being over there in prison wasn't such a good thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, so I, I have to bear that in mind. Uh, but, but other than that, you know, I, there's, there's nothing stopping me from saying things here. The only thing is I, I do have to be careful about what I say with respect to other people. So I've got to bear that in mind all the time, that my actions could endanger other people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, I've been careful about that. Um, so, yeah, but other than that, it's... And even to the point that when, you know, someone writes to you on Facebook purporting to be someone you know mm. in Myanmar, you, you really have to think twice about whether this is a potential yeah. trap yeah. that may end up incriminating, you know, the yeah. person that you actually, that you think you're communicating yeah. with. I mean, That's right. The, the, this whole area has been the most emotionally fraught because one of, one of the things I really desperately want to do is contact all these old friends, just, even just when I say contact, just hit like on a Facebook post and things like that. And I can't do it um, because I just, you know, I can't endanger them in that way. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that's immensely frustrating because, and again, because of communication issues and all that, I, I don't want them to think that, you know, I've just abandoned them, I've got back to Australia and everything's great, and, you know, have a wonderful time and, and all that. So, but I can't. So, yeah, it's very frustrating that. But you're right. I mean, there's been a few times where people have reached out in ways that it's never been clear to me if it's the person or it's someone, or, or they're acting under duress, perhaps, or, or it's just all fake, you know? And yeah, it's been a real problem, that one. Mm. There's one more question there. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Rocio Toya from Agencia EFE, Spain's international news agency. Just have a couple of questions. Um, in this situation, what is the role of China? And Australia has applied several sanctions as many countries. So what else should be done to, in order to kind of um, see Myanmar return to democracy? And if 
democracy is coming soon, uh, will the new government, democratic government, will consider to be more kind or consider the Rohingya minority to get the international support? So the, dealing with the second thing first, what, one of the other really good things, I think, to have emerged from the situation, and I mentioned that NUG, or National Unity Government, um, it's just so much better on, on the issue about Rohingya and all the ethnic minorities and so on. It, it's really extraordinary. The, the thing that really separates now from, say, the situation 10 years ago is just the degree of cooperation among the different groups. Mm -hmm. And the NUG in particular has gone dramatically out of its way, particularly on the Rohingya issue, but, but other things as well, uh, to be a different entity on this. So it's really good news on that front. Just to back it up too, um, I spent a lot of time with really young Myanmar people when I, I was involved in this think tank over there and, and then again in the prison. Um, and their attitudes on things like this, just fantastic. Like, they, they were horrified for the treatment of the Rohingya and all that. So um, it's a different order of things now. And, and that, I think, in itself is something that's really hopeful. Um, on the, the first thing, um, oh, yeah, about China and so on. So China, I think, is in a strange situation at the moment. Um, they're, they're really the most important player. The, the regime would end tomorrow if China withdrew their support. Um, so al although they're, they're sort of... Uh, the regime in Myanmar are, are emotionally closer to Russia these days mm. because the Russia, Russia doesn't criticise them or do anything except support them. But the Russian support to the Myanmar military is limited. In fact, the flow of weapons is sometimes the reverse. It's hard to know what's going on between those two. But, yeah, apart from that love-in, the, the real only support of material effect is China. Um, but China is... Well, I can only imagine China's incredibly confused and doesn't know what to do because it, it, didn't, it doesn't like the idea of a vibrant democracy on its border. It doesn't want that. But at the same time, it wants a relatively peaceful Myanmar because they've got all sorts of huge investments. They want this big port on the Bay of Bengal. They're strategically, they want to be close and all of that. But, they, yeah, they need the country to be stable for their economic investments to work out. Um, and so they were sort of tending towards the NLD on, on that score, but then the military come in, and politically that's sort of a, more amenable in a sense, but then the regime is so irrational that, that you know, the report you get from China is that they're looking at, well, hang on, you don't need to do that. You, know, you, you can be an authoritarian regime and, and do it smarter, I think is, you know, part of their, their response. Um, but then there's all sorts of other irritants that have come along the way. People here have probably heard about these weird cyber scam cities that have developed inside Myanmar and other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, the Chinese were, were really pressuring the Myanmar regime to close them down, and the regime was not, didn't. And so, in fact, part of the reason for my little bit of optimism I mentioned earlier about military developments is that China basically sent a signal to groups that they were supporting to you know, push back and close these scam cities and all that. So, um, yeah, so China is sort of all over the place, I think, at the moment and probably doesn't know how long to back the regime longer for. Obviously, there's a bigger strategic play going on there as well. But, but yeah, I can only imagine that Beijing or, or um, uh, Kunming, um, Yunnan province, which is the real player when it comes to China, are, are probably confused at the moment and not, not quite knowing what to do. Hmm. Oh, yeah, well, so on the sanctions, um, so the, the really effective sanctions that are in place at the moment are being levied above all by the United States, uh, financially sanctioning some of the banks uh, and some sanctions on jet fuel. Um, this is really highly targeted stuff um, because most Myanmar people, 90% of people in Myanmar don't have a bank account or anything like that. A bank sanction is not, not going to affect them. Likewise, they don't fly in aeroplanes. In fact, the biggest user of jet fuel in Myanmar now is the military, right? so the Air Force. So it seems to me that these sort of sanctions are highly targeted uh, and quite effective. And, and I think we're seeing that they're effective. If we look at what the regime's doing to try and ration foreign exchange, get foreign exchange, look at their actions, not, not just what they say, this seems to be really effective. So I guess for, for me, what I'd like Australia to do is join in that because uh, the, the Americans are doing it, the Brits are doing it, the European Union's doing it. Even Singapore is actually tightening the screws financially. And so I'd, I'd love for Australia to join in that. Uh, the practical effect, probably not that great. I can't imagine there's that much money here, although you do get stories every now and then. But, um, but 
just to join that as sort of with our traditional allies, it seems to me wouldn't cost us very much. Um, and yeah, m might might be a good place to start. I think. Mm. Sean, as you say, there's you know, it, it's hard to be optimistic. Somehow you find a way to do that. I mean, it seems to me there's a, it's a war of attrition, really, isn't it? And and it's, there's a question of is time on the side of uh, the junta or is it on the side of uh, democratic forces? And to complicate everything else, you've got the ethnic armed groups uh, uh, who, who are quite separate and with individual agendas to the uh, NUG, um, the National Union Government, so the, the shadow or opposition uh, government. You know, it's it's complicated. And even if the military were to collapse overnight, yeah. there's a question about a vacuum and who fills it. And it's not obvious. You know, it's not obvious who would fill it. Do you think? Dosu still has a future if if something if we were to talk about you know a, a post uh, Tatmadaw Myanmar I mean is there still a place for her within within that and could she fill the vacuum still today or has her authority been lost in all this No I I think she could um, and the reason why I think that is because I think the people of Myanmar would insist on it um, so I don't think it would even be her choice. I think that she would have no choice in it. I, I really think that people would demand that. It, again, but it's got to happen soon. Um, one of the tragic situations of all of this, if we look at the regime tactics with respect to Dorsu, they're waiting for her to die, I mean, to put it bluntly. Um, so she's 77 now. She has a number of health ailments and all that. They keep her in appalling conditions. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to wait it out. Um, but within the country especially, so even though, you know, outside it's a little bit different now, within Myanmar she's revered just as she always was, and remains the key player. Um, I, I would imagine that she probably wouldn't see herself occupying a lengthy period or anything, but, but if things were dr dramatically change in a good way, I could absolutely see her coming back. Not unlike, say, Nelson Mandela, a short-term sort of thing, uh, unifying figure, which I think, I, again, in the country, I, I think she still is. Um, and probably handing it over, you know, to a, a younger cohort. Well, one of the really great conversations I had with her was just about that, actually. And, in fact, it was a message that she asked me to pass on to people, which was just how proud she was of the younger people and how they were responding to the military coup and that even though their experience of democracy was so brief that, that they were so willing to defend it. Um, but, yeah, I spoke at length with her about... Um, yeah, about the young economic reformers and all that, and yeah, she had immense faith in them. So, yeah, I I, I could definitely envisage something like that in the short term. Um, that, but but I do think, again, time permitting, that that she would still play a role, particularly at that beginning period. Sean, uh, thank you for somehow. Yeah, finding optimism in, in the darkest uh, moments of your life and the darkest chapters in in entire country's history. Uh, it's quite a remarkable achievement. It's a, a brilliant thing to see you here on the stage uh, with us today. Um, and, and the book, you know, is probably the best way you could have uh, processed your experience. And as you say, I think you're rendering a great service to all your friends um, in prison, still languishing uh, by, by um, airing their message and, and, and by uh, keeping the flame alive, so to speak. So thank you uh, for your time today. Congratulations on the book and please join me in, in uh, thanking Trump. Thank you.